Hello and welcome again to another installment of uh, Authors at Google. It's, it's my honor to welcome to the lowly Authors at Google series the prestigious award-winning soon-to-be Nobel laureate for literature, I'm sure, John Hodgman. John, or Or should I just go ahead and call you Professor Hodgman? As a Yale graduate, and therefore a great deal better than the vast majority of us, he has held such profoundly important positions in American culture, such as editor for the New York Times Magazine, contributed to This American Life, yes. and the PC in Mac's PC versus advertising, um, versus Mac advertising campaign. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, finally, he's, he's made his mark in the <coughs> word with his former book, The Areas of My Expertise, an accomplishment that is humbly referred to as a compendium of complete world knowledge. Our debt to him may very well never be repaid. <laughs> He's also well known for his attempt to connect with the common man through his role as resident expert on The Daily Show. Common man. Common man. <laughs> very common. <laughs> where he has temporarily sunk to the level of cable jockey in order to educate the plebeian masses. This new book, More Information Than You Require, plug, <laughs> builds off the first, and as is indicated by the name, isn't really required since the areas of my expertise has covered all of that. Nevertheless, he has done society a favor yet again by filling us in on the details that weren't important enough to make it into volume one, but are important enough to renew his source of revenue. <laughs> So let us welcome this admitted proud elitist and a truly great American hero, John Hodgman. What do you do when you've written a great book, bettered the world where you live? Do you retire and rest on your laurels, or do you continue to give? Previous book of complete world knowledge was too short and easy to read. You wrote a new book of complete world knowledge. It's way more than what you'll need. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is John Hodgman. As noted by Jesse and others, some time ago I wrote a book entitled The Areas of My Expertise, a compendium of complete world knowledge. Now, some were dubious. How could a book that is only 236 pages long contain complete world knowledge? Well, my friends, the answer is very simple. I was lying. <laughs> of course, there is more knowledge in the world. More knowledge is being generated every day. And as it, is, as it is generated, so I learn it. And when I don't have time to learn it, I make it up. <laughs> as well, my own life has gone through a remarkable transformation since my first book, where once I was a mere professional writer and humble former professional literary agent. Now, through strange fate and unexpected circumstance, I have become a very famous minor television personality. <laughs> and so I return to you now with more information than you require, a second book of complete world knowledge, now extra complete, <laughs> on subjects as diverse as the past, as there is always more of it, the future, as there is still some left, <laughs> Hollywood, Gambling, the sport of the asthmatic man. <laughs> how to cook an owl. How to buy a computer from a street vendor. And most other subjects. <laughs> now, as this is a brand new book, so I require a brand new theme song. An update, if you will, on my previous theme song. And so here is Jonathan Colton to sing everything that you need to know about me. He sells computers and funny commercials in which he plays the PC. He wore a fat suit, he sneezed and fell down once, got nervous about surgery. Even though he's become hugely famous and wealthy, he's counting on you. If your computers are old and clunky, you know what you need to do. Cause tonight, you're holding the key, it fits in a lock, it opens the door, it shows you a room, a 
has a TV that's running an ad that's making you want some new computer. He sells computers. Please buy his computers. Thank you. Thank you for my new theme song, John. You're welcome. You know, I'm very happy to be in, in the, the uh, Apple Macintosh ads, obviously, but uh, I do do other things than sell computers, you know. I, oh, I, uh, I guess I hadn't noticed. I, I write books, and I'm on the, on the Daily Show with Jon Stewart, and um, no, you don't know any of that? It's no, I, no. It's, <laughs> it's surprising to me, because um, not only were you just singing about my book, uh huh. Uh, but also, we've known each other since college, <laughs> and we have been very close friends for a long time. I, I guess I just thought I knew you from the commercials. No, I, uh, <laughs> I suppose you've been very busy. I, I'm, I, it's true. I am distracted a lot of the time by, by the Internet, which Ladies is where I spend you, most of my time. You know, you know Jonathan Colton, of course. Jonathan, yeah. <clears throat> Jonathan, of course, is the, um, the feral mountain man that I rescued from the mountains of southern Connecticut. He was raised there by woodland creatures, and when I was going to Yale, I discovered him wandering around killing cats. And I, I brought him back to the university and showed him to my professors, and there I, you know, I taught him to speak English, and I shaved him as best I could. And, uh, and now, you see, he's doing very well for himself. He, he sings uh, songs and plays guitar and uh, even has learned how to use a, a computer. It's true. He, uh, he writes his little ditties down and then sends them out over the Internet. I, I find that to be charming, Jonathan. I think it's just... Thank, thank you. That's it's very true. nice. But I, I, uh, I'm actually not feral. I'm sorry, really? No, I'm not feral. I was raised by humans. I had a human family. I'm, I'm a human... All I thought that you were way. a feral mountain man. No, that is a that is a joke that you made up a few years ago. Oh. And uh, since then, you forced me to wear this ridiculous costume. <laughs> so I, no, not actually feral. Are you you? But you are you are from Connecticut, right? Yes, that is that is true. I am from Connecticut. Yeah, so, Connecticut. Kind of yeah. splitting hairs, don't you think? I mean. <laughs> Actually, Connecticut is quite a, quite a civilized place. We're we're pretty pretty forward thinking there. I see you're still wearing the outfit, though. I don't understand. You still have that ridiculous beard and everything. Yes. Well, and the coonskin cap. Yeah. Well, the difference is this time it is my choice to wear these things. Oh. I choose to wear them because they're very comfortable. Yes. Also, I I can't figure out how to get the shirt off. It's very <laughs> tight. Um, but you do. Record songs and put them out onto the internet. Is that right? That that is true. Yes. Via your website, JonathanColton.com. Yes, my website, JonathanColton.com. And, and do you, and do you have right. a do you have a major record label of some kind? No, no, I'm not enslaved to any uh, large uh, media corporation. I'm just completely independent. You're purely purely e-commerce, then, is what you're saying. That's right. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, a noble savage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, on the other hand, uh, published a book with a major media corporation called Penguin Putnam USA. Um, thank you, middleman. It's fantastic. Uh, with my book, uh, it is uh, extremely heavy and hard to ship around the country. And what's more, I only make about 5% of the cover price. So it's a pretty good deal for me, I think, <laughs> compared to your little enterprise. Um, there are, uh, like my previous book, uh, my new book, More Information Than You Require, is a compendium of complete world knowledge. It is a book of trivia, fascinating trivia and historical oddities and amazing true facts, all of which were made up by me. Um, there are, however, some technological improvements with the new book. Do any of you have a copy of my new book so I could demonstrate the technological... You, sir? Okay. Too late for you. You have it. <laughs> Sorry. Next time you get a copy of my book, don't put it in your bag. <laughs> it's not where it belongs. It belongs out here like this. <laughs> you see it is a hardcover edition. So that's, that's handy. It is, uh, it is an update and an upgrade, if you will, on the old book in that it is um, almost twice as long, so it's much heavier, so you can use it to hold down lighter books, for example. 
Uh, it is not exactly a sequel to my previous book, uh, so, mo more, uh, so much as it is a direct continuation. And so you will see if you open up uh, your copy to the table of contents, it picks up right here at page 100, 237. <laughs> 237 there. And that makes it seem longer than it actually is, which is always pleasant with any book. Uh, there is also an upgrade in that um, in my previous book, no one had thought to make it a page-a-day calendar. And that really annoyed me because we all know that that's where the money is, you know. <laughs> Everyone loves their page-a-day calendars, their 365 jokes about page-a-day calendars or whatever. Uh, Anxiety of Influence by Harold Bloom, page-a-day version. That's the best, best-selling page-a-day calendar in the world. Did you know that? A lot of Harold Bloom fans out there. Good to see you folks. Uh, and so, since my previous book was not made into a page-a-day calendar, I took a preemptive strike with this one. And so, you will notice if you flip through that it is not just a book, it is also a page-a-day calendar. There is a date on every page, uh, starting with the first day of the year, October 21st, when this book was published. <laughs> the Hodgminian calendar, if you will. And to make it uh, even more useful to you, I have included, as many page-a-day calendars do, uh, an a interesting little fact from history that did not happen on this date because I made it up. So for example, if you open up right near the beginning of the book, page 249, you will see at the top uh, November 10th, which is, I believe, today. And you'll see a little factoid here, 1969, Sesame Street debuts on public broadcasting. Viewers who grew up on the series may be surprised to learn that in early episodes, Oscar the Grouch was orange. That's true. Gordon was played by nine different men, also true. The body of Mr. Hooper was not yet embalmed and on display behind a glass panel outside his store. <laughs> and most of the storylines revolved around the subject of when Elmo would arrive and save them all. <laughs> and then you can enjoy that as a page-a-day calendar, and then like any page-a-day calendar, you just tear out the page. <laughs> and move on with your life. <laughs> Thank you. I have my own copy of the book here. <laughs> now, it may happen in your life that you don't know someone who has a copy of my book who will give it to you so you can tear a page out of it. Uh, that is why uh, I made sure that when my publisher published the copies of my book that they were all identical so that you could buy multiple copies <laughs> and not miss a beat. That way you can have two copies, one that you can read as a page-a-day calendar and tear out the pages and another copy that you can destroy in whatever way you want. So I recommend at least buying two copies in the future. There's lots of interesting information in this, uh, in this book. Um, it is a very useful book. Uh, I, uh, I tell you how to tell the future in this book. I actually told you how to tell the future in my last book, but I strangely could not predict that I would tell you again in this book. Um, but there's a lot more sort of folkloric ways of telling the future and how to cure uh, gout and how to cure hangovers with gin and that sort of thing. So like for example, I tell you how, how the old farmers, like in the old farmer's almanac for example, used to tell the future by uh, cutting open a pig and taking its spleen out. And this is true, this is an old Swedish American sort of agricultural way of, of predicting what would happen during the season. You would cut open, a, cut open a pig and take out its spleen and by the color and texture of the spleen um, you could probably predict that the pig would die. <laughs> Precisely when was uh, unknown. Uh, I'll also tell you how to get rid of all sorts of um, pests in your house, infestations that you might have, mice, cockroaches, termites. If you have termites, I have, for example, chimpanzees with long sticks always work very well for me. Um, Scotty dogs, Scottish terriers. You ever get Scotty dogs in the walls? Oh, the worst. They scramble around in there all night long. And you don't want to kill them, after all, because they're dogs. And we, those are animals that we don't generally kill for fun. So... Uh, let me tell you how you get rid of Scotty dogs. Um, take the white Scotty dogs and separate them from the black Scotty dogs and then turn them in opposite directions from one another and they magnetically repel one another out of your house. <laughs> little Scotty dog magnet humor. <laughs> Anybody remember Scotty dog magnets? One, one hand? Fantastic. That joke was for you. <laughs> the person who raised their hand over here was lying. You don't know what I'm talking about. Don't even try anymore. And of course, there's a lot of helpful information, for example, about how to be a famous minor television personality. You may notice that I am wearing a tuxedo.
Thank you, those of you who said ooh, it deserves it. This is my tuxedo that I get because I'm a famous minor television personality. I own this tuxedo. I do not rent tuxedo like you people do. This is my tuxedo, and I live a very glamorous life now that I'm a television personality. But, um, you know, it was not always this way. I used to have to rent my tuxedos. I used to have to rent all of my clothes, actually. I had to rent my own pants. It was very sad. Back when I was a magazine writer, I didn't have a lot of money. You know, it was hard, hard times. I ate a lot of ramen noodles, you know. Um, sometimes I couldn't even afford the, uh, the hot water. It was too fancy. I just had to eat the noodly biscuit. You know? You know that noodly biscuit? You know what I'm talking about, knee slapper. Hello. This guy was literally slapping his knee. It's a good thing you wore shorts, because we could all hear it. Um, thank you very much. I've never, that's never happened to me before. An actual, literal knee slap. Now someone in the back is going to go, guffaw. That's far, it's far better than what I usually get, which is someone in the back muttering to himself, polite chuckle. The internet. Um, well, if you ever do go through some hard times, and of course that'll never happen to people who work in technology, um, but maybe you can tell your friends, uh, if you're stuck eating the noodley biscuit for dinner, here's how to liven it up a little bit, spice it up a little by um, snorting the flavor packet before it... <laughs> And then you, you have yourself a grand old time. Make a night of it. Um, but now it's, life is very different for me. I, I, I own something that boils hot water. I own my own pants. In fact, I, uh, I, uh, I buy new pants every day made of beautiful silver and whalebone. Yeah, I only wear them once. Buy a new pair of pants every day and I throw them away at the end of the day. Because that's what my life is like now. And it's strange how quickly that becomes normal. To me, that's normal now. It's as normal to me as breathing underwater. Oh, I'm sorry. Have you people not had the gill operation yet? That's because you're not on television, I suppose. It's too bad. Um, but uh, a lot of people ask what it is like now to be a famous minor television personality and how it feels um, and how it happened. And so I wrote about that in my book. And I'm going to read to you a little bit from it now under the topic heading of how to be a minor television personality. Um, those of you who may have heard uh, a little of this on the radio on This American Life um, uh, will enjoy it again. So shut up. <laughs> um, but also, do not worry, because this is sort of the director's cut. If you heard it on the radio, I guarantee you, you did not hear the acres of information I'm about to impart to you on the subject of Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> Until recently, my only experience with Los Angeles had been a visit to Universal Studios as a child. Um, the Universal Studios tour specifically. I don't remember exactly when I went there, but it had to have been before 1985 because I remember that the uh, Battle of Galactica ride was still in operation there. Do anybody, does anyone here remember the Battle of Galactica ride? It was uh, what we call in the industry of amusement parks a dark ride, which is to say you sit in something and go through a dark room and see things rather than do something fun. <laughs> And in this case, what you sat on was the tram that would take you through the Universal Studios tour. And instead of, uh, and you would go through the uh, movie back lot that you were there to visit, and then suddenly it would take a left turn and take you into a crappy space station where you didn't want to be. And there, robots would shoot lasers at you until two guys in space helmets bounded out yelling and screaming and shot the robots with lasers, and then you were freed to go on with your life. Um, I must point out here that the two men uh, who bounded out were men. They were living, actual human men, not animatronic creations. I guess you would call them um, actors. And they would come out, and they would rescue humans dozens of times a day, day after day, uh, always in total silence. Because they did have dialogue, but they never said it. Their dialogue had been pre-recorded years before, presumably by other better actors. <laughs> and even at the time, I was 10 years old, it, it seemed to me that was a very ingenious way to torture actors. <laughs> and that is why it amused me. <laughs> and it still does. Uh, they closed that ride not long after my visit because the TV show it was based on was canceled and because strange 
uh, live space mime amusements became uh, unfashionable <laughs> at amusement parks. And I may indeed have been the last person to have seen it. And so after the ride was over, I went and sat down for a few moments on a park bench to ponder and absorb this historic moment. And that is when it happened to me. That is when I was approached by a grown man pretending to be Charlie Chaplin. Now, I suppose it is some people's dream to meet Charlie Chaplin or even to meet someone dressed up as Charlie Chaplin. But it was not my dream. Indeed, even at 10 years old, I found Chaplin's work to be pretty maudlin and cheap. He was no Buster Keaton, and as he approached me, I considered saying so to his face. But there was a problem. The problem was that at that time, I had very long hair. It was a ridiculous affectation, but not so ridiculous, I would argue, as dressing up as Charlie Chaplin. But the real problem wasn't that. The problem was that because I was a small child without a beard or a mustache, uh, a lot of people thought I was a girl. And so this would lead to embarrassing situations, such as double takes whenever I went into the men's bathroom, for example, or people insisting that my name had to be pronounced Joan Hodgman, uh, or being uh, expected to kiss Charlie Chaplin <laughs> on his white powdered cheek. This sort of thing happened to me all of the time. And so the moment came after some predictable cane and bowler hat shenanigans that Charlie Chaplin sat next to me and indicated that it was time for me to kiss him. Uh, his expectations, of course, went unspoken, uh, just as mine were perfectly clear. I did not want to kiss Charlie Chaplin at all. But let's just say they didn't call him the little tramp for nothing. He waited me out. It was clear I was powerless. It was clear what was going to happen. I'm not proud of it, but I let it happen. I'll take it, sir. It's my dad from, from New York. Hi, Dad. How are you? Are you calling for John? Oh, Michael? Oh, I'm sorry. This is John Hodgman. Is Michael your son? He said it was your... He, oh, your name is John, because I saw that on the caller ID. How are you? Um, you know, uh, Michael can't take the call at the moment because he's, uh, no, he's not on the crapper, sir. He's uh, actually listening to me give a presentation at Google right now, and his phone rang. Oh, no, 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 it's not your fault. How could you have known? I appreciate your apology. I, you know, I just, w I just wish he had turned off his phone or... My name is John Hodgman, yes. Please tell, please tell me, you don't mean to say you have never heard of me. I was, just, I was just giving a speech about what it is like to be a famous minor television person. In any case, it was, is there a message you'd like me to give to Michael? Not, no. Oh, okay, you'll give it directly to him. All right, I'll, I'll tell him. Very well. Thank you very much. Goodbye. I'm just going to keep this up here. I tried to turn it off. I don't understand. You'll get this back in June. All right. Sit down now. So, I was saying, Charlie Chaplin wanted to kiss me. I did not want it to happen, but I was powerless. It was clear what was going to happen. I'm not proud of it. I let it happen. And that was my introduction to Los Angeles, a traumatic, silent comedy, same-sex date rape. <laughs> now, I couldn't understand at the time why anyone would expect a complete stranger to want to kiss him on the cheek just for showing up and sitting down. But now I understand, because now I'm on television. Sometimes I am asked, how is it that you became a famous minor television personality? And my answer is always the same. I went on television. As simple as that. I had written a book of fake facts and was asked to be a guest on a famous uh, program of fake news. And I did, and they asked me to come back and contribute comedy 
to that program, uh, which seemed very surprising and surely the strangest thing that would ever happen to me in my life. I was then asked to audition for a series of ads for Apple Computer, and I thought, uh, well, I'll go to the audition and just see what it's like, because it, going to the audition will probably be a fun story to tell over dinner or later on when I visit you people at Google. <laughs> tell the story about this uh, audition I went on for this job that I would never in a million years get. But I got the job, and it ruined the story, so I'm sorry. <laughs> It's a pretty typical, mundane, overnight Hollywood success story. The only thing that makes it unusual is that it actually happened more or less overnight. I mean, in a very condensed period of time, in about three months, and largely by accident. And as a result, I am older and fatter and more wall-eyed and tweedy than most people who are starting out a career in television. Uh, I'm not being modest. When you are on television, you don't just see the pose that you perfect for yourself in the mirror. You see yourself from all angles, clearly and cruelly as if you were in the body of another person. Here are some of the words that internet blogs have used to describe me. <laughs> the pudgy John Hodgman. Chubby John Hodgman. The round PC. Stout John Hodgman. Tubby Hodgman. Portly John Hodgman. And cutie. This is the anomaly. <laughs> That one came from a website that includes a regular feature that maps celebrity sightings in New York City. Do you know what a website is? <laughs> in this case, an anonymous tipster reported to the website accurately that I had been taking the B train south from my observatory in the Upper West Side where I then lived. Now, here's what happened from my point of view. I was riding the train just like any other day. I was wearing my brown coat and my brown jeans and a neighbor had just told me that uh, I looked like a UPS man. And I was just sitting there minding my business, casually deciding to never speak to that neighbor again, uh, when a woman got on the train and she gave me a look that I recognize now, a kind of surprise double take of recognition and confusion, the kind of look that you get uh, if you have long hair and you're a child and you go into the men's room. And then a man came on the train and gave me the same look. Now, which one of these two was it? Which one was the anonymous tipster? Uh, I will never know. Neither of them seemed particularly drunk or insane, but one of them had to have been the one who told the internet I was a cutie. Whoever it was, they went on to note that I also looked like a UPS man. <laughs> so here is a fashion tip from the stars, no brown jeans. After that, these unexpected brushes with fame in which unexpectedly I was the famous person started happening with some frequency. Citing uh, Radio Shack, uh, Greenfield, rural Massachusetts. The young guy at the counter asked me to autograph an old receipt. <laughs> what are you doing here, he asked, in a voice that contains a host of further questions, such as, what are you doing in Massachusetts, in Greenfield, at Radio Shack? <laughs> Answer, I was buying speaker wire. Citing, Northwest Airlines flight from Philadelphia to, well, I'm only human, <laughs> you know? I can't get the music to go into it through the air. <laughs> I require wires. <laughs> Northwest Airlines flight from Philadelphia to Minneapolis. Soon after closing my eyes to go to sleep, I hear a click and see a flash. My, the insides of my eyelids briefly light up blood red, and I open them, and I see a 10-year-old child putting his camera away. He was taking my picture as I was asleep, <laughs> presumably for some sick website that he runs. <laughs> I asked for him to be removed from the plane, but I am refused my request because technically we are already in the air. As if I didn't know. Citing the Museum of Television and Radio, New York City, I go to a party to celebrate the new season of Battlestar Galactica. Not the old version that had the ride at Universal Studios tour, but the new version in which the robots are erotic, finally. <laughs> I am here because I had written about the show back uh, for a national magazine back when I was a writer and fan of the show before I had ever been on television. And now at the party, I'm enjoying catching up with one of the show's creators and trying not to geek out too much and simply congratulate him on the success of the show and thanking him for allowing me to come to this party, but he's not listening. All he wants to know is how it happened. How had I gone from writing about TV to actually appearing on TV? And I explain it to him as I explained it to you. And as I do so, I feel a certain shame that I had leaped past thousands, millions even, trained actors and journeymen performers to get a job that I had not earned. I paid a lot of dues in my life as a writer, as a literary agent, 
as a cheesemonger, as a traffic counter, but not as an actor per se. I did not even need to work, for example, many long and hard and silent days in the Battle of Galactica ride, <laughs> paying my dues. And at that very moment that I was feeling ashamed, a waiter passes by with a tray of cocktails, and he says that he hopes that I am feeling better. And it takes me a moment to realize that he is referring to a television ad in which I pretended to have a sneezing fit. And so I laugh and I tell him, thank you. And then, like a sneezing fit, it doesn't stop. One person after another comes up to me, talking about the ads, wanting to say hello. Soon, an Academy Award-winning actress is shaking my hand and congratulating me for a job well done on television. This is inappropriate. <laughs> it is exciting, but it is entirely inappropriate. It makes me uncomfortable, as I do think it makes everyone else in the party uncomfortable, too. Because no one knows why I'm there anymore. No one knows what role I'm supposed to play at this party. Am I a journalist? Am I a fanboy? Or am I some E-list celebrity who had been hired to come in and give the party a little E-list buzz? <laughs> this kind of hierarchical uncertainty is unwelcome at any party, and especially a television party, and I worry that I'm somehow ruining the night for my space friends. And so the first moment I can, I sneak away and go home alone in the rain. <laughs> Don't worry, it, it picks up. <laughs> Except for old Hodgman, gets better. <laughs> Sighting, Soho, New York City, the Apple Store. <laughs> General, store-wide freakout. <laughs> I am asked to pose with people, pose for cell phone pictures with people. I'm asked to pose with people for cell phone pictures. The store greeter cannot believe it is me. She is jumping up and down. <laughs> they don't know why I am there. Answer, iPod docking cable. <laughs> Someone on the staff starts to play videos of me on a giant screen. Suddenly, I am like a mascot walking around a theme park. I'm Charlie Chaplin at Universal Studios, and everyone wants to kiss me. When you are a young person, all of this feels inevitable. It feels inevitable. Of course you will be on television. Or of course you'll be an astronaut or the president. It's hardwired into every gland, this ambition to be known and renowned. But then, of course, you grow older, pudgier, stouter, <laughs> portly. <laughs> you have children, or you get a job, or are drawn by fate to one life or another. Only the deranged don't notice that the possibilities for their life are narrowing. And only the happy look around and say, that's fine. I accept that I will never be a famous minor television personality. At least I have written this wonderful book of fake trivia. I am a happy man. And then, just when you've discarded the last shred of a shred of a shred of the fantasy, say, of becoming an astronaut, it is unsettling to have someone then suddenly, unexpectedly knock on the door and say, it's time to go into outer space. Come with me. Don't pack. You don't get used to it. You put on a space suit, and you learn to eat dehydrated food, and you learn to poop while floating upside down. <laughs> but you never really feel like you're supposed to be up there orbiting the Earth. And honestly, now that I think about it, you don't even have to go into space at all to get this feeling. You can get the same feeling just by being asked to pretend to go into outer space by, for example, doing a cameo appearance on Battlestar Galactica, which is exactly what happened to me. <laughs> These days, when I come to L.A., it is not traumatic. Los Angeles is a lovely city, especially so if you are on television. <laughs> Recently, I got to stay at a very fancy hotel. The woman at the door greeted me by name before I even checked in. I stayed in a suite in which I was told a famous person had died. <laughs> it was perfect. <laughs> I saw many other famous people there, of course. I don't, you know, we don't tell tales on one another. Okay, I'll tell you. Jerry Stiller. Jerry Stiller was coming out of the pool, wearing a robe, got into the elevator with me. Very, very, very small elevator. Very humid ride. <laughs> Felt like I was wearing Jerry Stiller. <laughs> Wasn't bad. And then I saw another person as I was checking out of my room. My room had a uh, private entrance to the street, and I pulled up my car. I was putting my suitcases in the trunk. And the door to the next room opened, and a man came out. And I nodded to him, just a couple of fellow guests of the hotel. After all, we were neighbors, really. It was Justin Timberlake. Good morning, I said. And Justin Timberlake did not like that at all. 
Justin Timberlake literally grunted and jumped back, and not in a sexy way. He was terrified. And as Justin Timberlake walked very quickly away from me, I realized in a way that I never could before what I had done to this poor millionaire superstar. I had made him feel trapped and cornered and vulnerable, and I felt terrible about it. Even as I followed him down the street. <laughs> I felt terrible about it. Even, even as I followed him down the street screaming his name, trying to take a photograph of his vagina, I felt, I felt awful. I don't know if I'll get to stay at that hotel again. Every time I stay there, when I check out, I think that might be the last time. You know, television came along and cast this spell on me. It'd be naive to imagine that the spell could not break just as quickly. I mean, that's a Hollywood story, right? To be discovered out of nowhere and then be forgotten just as quickly. I mean, that's showbiz. As a matter of fact, sometimes now, if I'm feeling tired or a little sad, I'll go and put on my UPS man outfit and hit the subway. <laughs> just to see if anyone will still, you know, recognize me. Just to check. Just to check. It's very embarrassing, I realize. But I do it. Most of the time, though, nothing happens. No matter how crowded it is, no one recognizes me. No one says anything. They're reading and talking, thinking about their own journeys, where the train is taking them next. They don't say anything to me at all. And that's when I sit back, and I look at them all, and I think to myself, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> don't you have televisions? I'm sitting right here. Thank you. Ties a little like John McCain. Starbuck is a hot head. Apollo is sensible. There's a lot of unresolved sexual tension there. And even as the Cylons hunt us, they do it in a sexy way. Helping the six that difference. Gentlemen, is this on? Is this on? As Jonathan Colton, at this point uh, in the program, it would be uh, acceptable for you to ask questions and for me to provide answers if you have them. I believe there is some Google procedure for the amplification of questions. Um, or if you wish to scream, you may. There are other people in the world, I guess, watching. Hello, people. <laughs> Humans, they're not. Oh, yeah, they're waving back. Hello. <laughs> Good, good, good work. You're not really in frame. Are you hiding something? Do you have any questions out there in the world? Just write it on that whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> they all have whiteboards. It's fantastic. No, no questions in this room? Um, oh, here comes the microphone. I don't see how this is going to work at all. While that microphone's going over there, sir, why don't you come up to this microphone? Uh. Hello? Hello? What's your name, sir? Ethan. Ethan, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now, you're talking to me. Just stay here. There we go. Rotate. There. there. Hi, Ethan. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? Just fine, thank you. What is your question? Uh, are you the last Cylon? Um, I am not really supposed to answer any questions about my appearance in Battlestar Galactica. Um, but I don't think that would be um, a satisfying <laughs> plot development <laughs> for people who watch Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> I think that would be pretty... I'm just saying... Are you sure? I, I just think that would be pretty disappointing <laughs> if, the, if the reveal of the final fifth Cylon was somebody who's never been on the show before. <laughs> And it's basically like, it would be like saying, and guess what? The final Cylon is Paul Lind, <laughs> <laughs> which would be delightful, 
but I, you know, so I will let that speak for itself. Why don't you hand that microphone around, and then, sir, you had a question over here. Why don't we do the other side? I'm sorry. I'll get to you in a moment, and then we'll move that microphone over there. Yes, sir. I, I was wondering when the audio book comes out. The audio book? Um, the audio book. Of this book, you mean? Yes, of the second book. Well, in a, in a way, this book already is an audio book, in that if you read it aloud to yourself... <laughs> But it's not the same as having you read it to me. Um, I know, that's true. Well, uh, Jonathan and I did a, a recording of the first book for audio, and um, it, we hope to, we will do it again for this one. But we did that recording after we had toured the first book around quite a bit. So, um, you know, I think that we will, after this tour, we'll know what plays on audio, what sounds good, what kind of jokes we have to tell to one another, and try to replicate that experience of the, of the first book. Um, so I think the audiobook will be coming out in 2095. <laughs> uh, yes, sir, with the microphone. I'd like to ask him a question. <laughs> I don't know. Am I allowed to answer questions? <laughs> it's just fine. Nice. Um, so How I was just mic? listening to How some of... Mike. <laughs> How is Mike? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, you saw that. <laughs> Um, you may ask Jonathan Colton. About yes, it. I was listening to some of your music over the weekend. You're a Jonathan Colton fan, I take it? Yes. Okay. Leave me alone. Um, <laughs> Fuzzy Lobster. What's the deal with that song? I, 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 I well, didn't I hear the That's an idea that I invented <laughs> that John stole from me and put in his book. No, that's not true. John, uh, the, the Furry Old Lobster uh, actually comes from John's uh, original book. He wrote in that book. A, a history of the furry old lobster, uh, and and I wrote a song uh, to go with that that history. John can explain the history, I think. No, no, maybe. <laughs> uh, perhaps you were dead. In the, to him. In, the er, in the previous book, I gave a, a short history of the lobster in America, in which I explained that uh, the lobsters were originally brought to this country uh, at the turn of the century and released in Central Park, where they bred uh, <laughs> very much like crayfish. I mean, that, that kind of, they bred very quickly and became a nuisance. So they were then shipped to Maine by Teddy Roosevelt, who was the police commissioner of New York at the time, uh, where the animal that had previously been known as the lobster, uh, a kind of sea otter, uh, quickly was destroyed by the new lobster. And that is why we don't call the sea otter the lobster anymore. And then Jonathan wrote a very sad sort of sea shanty about the plight of the furry old lobster. Kind of a Gordon Lightfoot kind of deal. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. Which maybe he'll sing at the end of this. Yay. Um, let's, let, give me that microphone, sir. <laughs> let's do it this way. This is much better. Do it Donahue style. <laughs> oh, you have a microphone. I do. I can give that one too. to me. <laughs> Oh boy. Hey, I'm John. Do you have a question for me or for Jonathan Colton? Um, my question is, now that we have access to complete world knowledge, isn't building a search engine a colossal waste of time? The question was, <laughs> when is the audiobook coming out? I don't feel it is my job to explain your job to you. Um, you know, simply having access to complete world knowledge doesn't mean that you do not need uh, aid in pinpointing what you are looking for. Now, you people provide some kind of service, just as I do. I, told, I tell you the knowledge you need to know and put it in a book in the order in which I think you should know it. Other people prefer to find out for themselves. Fools. <laughs> Um, let's see. Who else? Raise your hand if you have a question. We don't need that microphone anymore, you see. Give that to me. I'm sorry I threw it at you. Yeah, give them all to me. I don't want a repeat of the Jonathan Colton escapade. I want to have, I want to be able to get in there and stop things before they shut it down, before it gets out of hand. Hi, I'm John. What's your name? Ellen. Ellen, and what? Here, you can use this one. And what is your, is your question for me or for Jonathan Colton? 
Well, I was going to ask the same question, that hundreds of us took time off our work because we thought our job of indexing the world's information was complete. But sure. since that's already been asked, and you won't help us with that, I'll just thank you for making pasty people seem cool. Thank you very much, Ellen. <laughs> thank you, Ellen. That's very kind. And it makes what I have to say all the harder. Um, there is a reason why I asked you all here. And indeed, your job is complete. <laughs> um, if you would please give me your badges. <laughs> and the flank steak you had for lunch. Uh, no, I hope that you all are gainfully employed for a long, long time so I can come back and visit you. Who else has a question? I will get to you. Um, I already spoke to your friend. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, is you, what is your name? Robert. Okay, Robert, what's your question? So, since you've been on The Daily Show, I wanted to know what you thought of The Daily Show as, what its role is as to provide actual news rather than fake news. I feel like a lot of people actually get real news from it. <laughs> the question is, is John Stewart really short? Yes. <laughs> He is very short. Um, people do get a lot of real news from The Daily Show, um, which is, you know, appropriate because largely the jokes in The Daily Show are simply revealing what truthfully happened and then sort of crying <laughs> in an amusing way. You know. I think it's a very valuable source of actual information because, you know, the, the kind of the jokes that I do on the show where I'm just – spouting nonsense and, you know, making up facts is very unusual for the show itself. I mean, that's more Colbert style. Do um, you have a question, sir? Okay. What is your name? Uh, Chris Tabono. Hey, Chris Tabono. And what is your question? Um, so now the election's over, are you going to be on the show more often? Uh, the question is, will I be on the show more often? Generally speaking, uh, it works out that I go on twice a month. It wasn't the election that was the problem. It was that I was working, finishing my book and doing the book tour and stuff like that. I would love to get back into a regular pattern of twice a month because it fits in very nice with my bathing and eating schedule. <laughs> um, but I serve at their pleasure. Uh, whenever they have an idea for me, I will come back. Um, I, we can take questions way out there. I can get a microphone to you right away. <laughs> if, on the periphery. Do you still have a question? Yeah. Okay, uh, what is your name, sir? Well, you, first of all, you guys are wearing matching t-shirts. Uh, I know, it's kind of sad. Okay. <laughs> I was going uh, to say that. <laughs> I have a question for Jonathan, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, now that shortly in the future, anyway, we're going to have a new president, are you going to add a new verse to Washia Jeffy? <laughs> yes, you're referring to my... Uh... Hi, I'm John. What's your question? <laughs> Yes, I will, I will have to, although the, the mnemonic device uh, that lists all of the presidents, actually the number of syllables in each nickname for the president tells how many terms they served. So I sort of need to wait at least four years before I decide whether to call him O or Bam or Bama or Hussein. <laughs> Jonathan, we have a question back here for you. Go ahead. It's actually for you, John. Oh, really? <laughs> Hi, I'm John. What's your name? Candace. Hi, Candace. Hi. I was wondering, are you part of the creative process in creating the Apple ads, or do they just give you a script? Uh, only, yeah, they, they write a script, and then Justin and I will do a certain amount of ad-libbing, but, I mean, and that sometimes makes it in, but only in the sense that we are bringing those two characters to life. <laughs> Has Justin ever been here? He, is, you should, he should come here. He's very, very funny, very sweet guy, and... He doesn't always have a lot to say in the ads, but we, I mean, the, we uh, play off each other really, really, really well, and I don't feel that he often gets enough credit for what he does. Um, so how do they decide? By looking good. <laughs> so how do they decide that? You, know, you have a follow-up, Candace. I do have a follow-up. Okay. <laughs> so how in do fact, they decide? would you move, please, so I can sit down? <laughs> Go ahead, Candace. Okay. <laughs> So how they decide that? It's good to see you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. How have you been? It's been it's good now that you're here. Uh, that's what I thought. <laughs> so 
was wondering how did they decide that you'd be the PC and not the Mac? <laughs> well, I was not privy to that decision. But I think it's pretty obvious. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Maybe one or two more. Anybody? I want that microphone back. I don't want that going around. We're going to do one here. Stand by. And then get that one over to that woman right away. <laughs> and then we'll do one more over here. Did you have one? You, you, okay. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Go. Hi. Uh, my name is Miss Sue. I wanted to ask which Your one? Your name is Miss Suzanne? What? Miss Sue. <laughs> Oh, I apologize. I, I misheard you. Okay, very well. That's right. Um, so, uh, which one of the ads was your favorite so far? Um, I, I know everyone loves Pizza Box. That was fun because I didn't have to wear clothing. <laughs> We're going to do lightning round. Get these moving around. Lightning round. Quick. Go. 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 So, I got here at uh, 1230. And as you can see, I didn't get a seat. I was already too late for that. But yeah. you were standing in the back. Is this the biggest room you have for these sorts of things? Um, other than our big cafeteria, yeah. You have bigger rooms, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just so you know. Um, so my question is, you, you last updated your blog at 12 noon, and you were here by 12.30. I was is that so? Yeah. I was wondering if you blogged when you were here. No, I posted a blog. Which post was it? Uh, the most recent one. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice try. Uh, move, these, move these microphones around. Keep them moving. Keep them moving. Go. Lightning round. Quick. Go. <laughs> no, no, no. So I just saw Live Free or Die Hard, which is starring Justin. What's your first motion picture going to be? I've already been in one. Next. <laughs> what, what's going to be in that is all? Uh, more things. Next. You, more, more, more. Sir, do go. You think, do you think the next administration will be as funny as the previous one? Uh, it remains to be seen. Next. <laughs> go. Yell it out. Yell. I don't. Do. I'd like to slow down the pace to, in order to answer this question. I have a very long answer for this question. Paul and Storm are good friends of mine and very talented musicians. And it's. Uh, it's lovely to work with them. They're, they're wonderful people, good friends, and uh, very generous, generous about sharing the stage with their fellow performers. Uh, look, people. <laughs> I'm not a fool. I know we're in Jonathan Colton country right now. It's true. I know. And, you know, the reality is that... You know, since the first book tour that Jonathan and Cummings went on, his career has really exploded, and properly so. I'm a big supporter of internet music. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't make him laugh. I just described <laughs> a genre of music. And the reality is, you know, like, we, we've been on tour for this new book, but Jonathan had an opportunity to go out to England in the middle of the tour, so he, you know, went off, which is really kind of astonishing when you think about it, because I could not go tour England. My book is not available there. Um, they have not sold the rights to it. There are borders in the world of books that do not exist. Now, I'm not talking about bookstores either. Um, whereas Jonathan can go there and sell out houses in Glasgow and London with, uh, without even selling a hard copy of anything that he makes. So... I mean, it's an astonishing new world that he is taking advantage of, and rightly so. And that means that probably, I mean, I would guess that this is probably the last tour that we'll be able to do together because there's just too much interest in him and, and me, and, you know, fame is a lonely road, and that's the way it goes. So. <laughs> well, don't despair, don't despair, because, um, you know, even though I won't have my Feral Mountain Man to kick around anymore, Not I, have a, uh, I, have a, <laughs> I have a backup plan. Arguably, I don't need him anymore. You see what I'm saying? Because of... I know that... Oh, I forget the words. I know you belong to somebody new. But today, you belong to me.
was it? Do you remember? Furry Old Lobster? Furry Old Lobster, yeah. Yeah, you want to do that one or another one? Yeah, sure. Furry Old Lobster. Old, ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan. Here. Not sure I remember it. This should be interesting. I, don't, I totally don't remember it. You see what I'm talking about? <laughs> He doesn't even remember it. Play one of your own. All right. Code Monkey. Code Monkey. Sure, yeah. sure. This, no? This... No. <laughs> Man. That guy's... Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't do Code Monkey. Please. Don't do Code Monkey. <laughs> yeah, you want to come up and play it in front of the microphone? <laughs> All right, this is a song about zombies. Uh, what I need you to do is uh, is act like zombies. Uh, there's a there's a thing you need to sing. It's the part for you. It's very simple. Here's how how it goes. All we wanna do is eat your brains. That's the whole thing. Happens twice in every chorus. Uh, let's let's try it all together. Sing nice and loud and proud. Even you people in foreign countries watching over the wires. Ready? All we want to do is the brain. Very nice. Very nice. The only, I have one criticism. You sound lovely, I should say. I have one criticism, which is really like zombies. What's happening over there? Uh, what, what we need is a little more chaos. If you were a zombie who was trying to sing a song, I maybe wouldn't sound very good. Uh, maybe your mouth has been torn apart by other zombies. Maybe you have no tongue. Maybe you've lost the faculty for speaking English. Also, you just want brains, really. You're not very interested in singing. So let's, let's just add a little bit more chaos and a little bit more messy zombie business to it. Uh, ready? Let's try that again. Thank you. Uh, this is what would happen if uh, you were trapped uh, inside and there were zombies outside, and one of the zombies was your most despised coworker. Hey, you, Tom, it's Bob from the office down the hall. Good to see you, buddy. How have you been? Things have been okay for me, except that I'm a zombie now. I really wish you'd let us in. I think I speak for all of us when I say I understand. Why you folks might hesitate to submit to our demands. And here's an FYI, you're all gonna die screaming. I mean, no one's gonna eat your eyes. Pick Tom, but is this really your plan? Spend your whole life locked inside a mall. Maybe that's okay for now, but someday you'll be out. 
out of food and guns And then you'll have to make the call Not surprised to see you haven't thought it through enough You never had the head for all that bigger picture stuff But Tom, that's what I do And I plan on eating you slowly All we want to do is eat your brain I mean, no one's gonna eat your eyes. Oh, you're a here. Maybe we can compromise. Open up the door. We'll all come inside and eat your brain. I'd like to help you, Tom, in any way I can. I sure appreciate the way you're working with me I'm not a monster Tom well technically I am I guess I am I've got another meeting Tom maybe we could wrap this up no we'll get to common ground somehow meanwhile I'll report back to my colleagues who were chewing on the door I guess we'll table this for now. I'm glad to see you take constructive criticism well. Thank you for your time. I know we're all busy as well. And we'll put this thing to bed. And I bet your head open